thought what I would do today um, on a relaxed Saturday afternoon prior to golf would be to um, talk about my experience in the sandbox over the past 18 years, where I've seen digital pathology, where I think it is today, and um, where we're going. So, does anybody know who said this? Okay, good. So we have one. So, um, the non-Americans in the room, the uh, filler slides uh, are quotes by uh, Peter Lawrence Yogi Berra, uh, sometimes called Yogi Berra. He was a baseball player, manager, and coach for 19 years. He was an 18-time All-Star. He won the World Series 10 times, batted 285. Hit 348 home runs, I think, give or take. Uh, over 1,400 RBIs. So he's more than qualified to provide the quotes in a medical lecture. But I think that a lot of them uh, fit quite well. So what's worked? Uh, so I'm going to actually start at the end. And then we can all, uh, well, we have to listen to Professor Hamilton, and then we can all go. Um, but um, this is my son's first grade uh, uh, science class, essentially. I'll probably get a little emotional here, because it's an, it's an older picture. Uh, so these kids are now going into high school. Uh, but when they were very innocent and very naive, and you could actually teach them things, this was a great experience. So I brought in a microscope and uh, with a digital camera on it, you can see. And we broadcasted that through the projector. And I brought in some slides to show the students. And I brought in acute appendicitis and cholecystitis and pictures of bone. And <clears throat> turns out first graders ask really, really hard questions. <laughs> Uh, am I going to get cancer? Uh, where does cancer come from? They start rolling up their pants and sleeves. You know, is this cancer? They talk about their grandmother's cancer. Um, so hopefully your questions won't be as hard. But 125 first graders, it was a little, um, a little stressful. Uh, and you see my son has not really bought into this digital pathology thing. He's still looking through the microscope, and all of his colleagues are looking at the screen. Um, but uh, a little girl in the front row whose family actually moved to the UK shortly after this um, raised her hand and asked a question. And, and uh, prior to that, I had showed the science teacher there on the left. I said, you know, perhaps when these kids go to medical school and maybe some of them become pathologists, the microscope won't be as used as much. Uh, we have this technology now called digital pathology. So I happened to open up my iPad and I showed her a whole slide image. It was February in North Carolina. And I said, these images are in a cloud server in Chicago, buried under two feet of snow. But, you know, I can look at the images from Chicago here in North Carolina. So at the end of the presentation, the students, she said, it'd be neat if you showed the kids the, the whole slide image. Or I don't think she called it a whole slide image. She said, it'd be cool if you showed the kids your iPad. Um, and so I, you know, I whipped it out. I hope the Wi-Fi worked and everything. And I started moving the slide around. I, so I told the kids, you know, this image was in Chicago. This was a patient in Chicago, and we're in North Carolina but we could look at the images together. And this little girl in the front row said, so does that mean that doctors all over the world can look at the same image at the same time? I said, that's exactly what it means. So the good news is, the people that are gonna be taking care of us understand this. <laughs> um, so this is where the story starts. I went to a meeting I had no business being at, the American Association of Clinical Chemistry, uh, pick up an award on a paper we wrote, as uh, is the case with a lot of scientific publications. Our initial results didn't really stand the test of time. But in 1999, we won an award for this uh, paper, uh, Laboratory Indicators of Ethanol Consumption, at the ACC meeting um, in San Francisco. And I was active duty military. It was prior to 9-11, so we were required to wear our uniforms. Uh, so there's that with the award. And uh, handheld digital cameras are becoming mainstream, if you think about 1999. So uh, AACC, it's getting bigger again now, but that was about a 40,000-person meeting large booths, and I went up to the Olympus booth, and I said, you know, do you have any handheld digital cameras? And they said, no, we didn't bring our, you know, consumer electronics to this show, but there's a couple of people over there with a microscope on a, uh, on a stick, on a, or a camera on a microscope on a stick. So I went over there, and sort of intuitively, I pushed the mouse around, and this image on the screen moved, and I said, what is that? They said, you just drove a microscope 300 miles away in Newport Beach. So um, that, in 1999, was a company called Illumia, which became Trussell, which became Clarion, which became Zeiss, and then I think it sort of, the story sort of ends there. But the point is, is there was robotic microscopy in 1999. It was probably technology ahead of its time. But at the time, in the military, given our situation, I thought it was a perfect solution to solving a problem that we had. 
in terms of solo pathologists located all over the world that needed remote support. This was about a year before whole slide imaging, a couple of years before whole slide imaging started to become commercially available. And in truth, it was probably technology ahead of its time because a lot of us weren't even doing online banking, let alone making a diagnosis over the internet. So this was my office in uh, 2000 at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, which no longer exists. That building no longer exists. The picture is, um, if you've ever been to Chicago, is the lakefront of Chicago, the Shedd Aquarium and the Adler Planetarium in the foreground. Used to be an airport there. That airport is gone. So this is a really old picture. And the point is that um, this was technology that was available um, 17 years ago now that we deployed um, within the military to take care of our patients. And this was our big digital imaging center. So I was a young, naive Army captain, and I got a little space in the lab. You can see there's an APC unit on the floor down here, um, and that is um, propped up on a two by four, because occasionally the immunostainer would leak, and we don't want the APC getting destroyed. So, but we made it work, and we had a Nikon cool scope, which are no longer largely available, uh, another digital imaging system, document scanner, color printer, big deal in 2001. So the idea was that we could support remote pathologists, and I chose to intentionally to do frozen sections um, to validate the technology, thinking that if you could do it for frozen sections, you could easily do it for formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And the initial idea was to have these robotic microscopes deployed around these smaller hospitals that were largely only one or two pathologists that could send cases to regional medical centers uh, within their specific region. So whether it was um, Texas or Germany, Washington State, uh, Washington DC, Georgia, et cetera. There would kind of be what we called in those days a hub and spoke arrangement where you would get regional support. But quickly people realized um, they didn't have to do that. They could send cases directly to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, which no longer exists. So one of the morals of the story is like, don't work where I've worked because some of those places go out of business. So, um, <laughs> so, the AFIP is closed, but at the time, it was a regional worldwide, or a worldwide referral center, and people started sending cases to uh, Walter Reed, uh, to AFIP directly. So long story short, we deployed about 25 microscopes on three continents. Uh, some fun stories I can tell you later about, perhaps, in Korea and Iraq, uh, deploying microscopes and um, supporting uh, the fighting soldier and their families back home. And then we started to teach the residents how to do this and the fellows. Looked at uh, cases in the same day. There were long days, but looked at cases in the same day from Germany and Korea and published that in Modern Pathology, as you saw. So this is an old story now. Um, and every time I tell the story, I try to make it a little bit shorter. But it's an old story. It was an old story then, actually, in truth, uh, because there was technology available in the 80s that allowed you to look under a microscope and transmit that image to somebody else thousands of miles away and make a diagnosis. And this was, appeared in the Washington Post um, in 1986, a, difference, uh, a consultation from Texas to Washington, D.C. And I didn't realize this at the time, uh, because Toby Cornish, uh, who's now at the University of Colorado, was at Johns Hopkins recently, actually found this. Now that the AFIP is closed, people are kind of rummaging through the archives. So he got access to some of this stuff. And he found this uh, article, actually, from January of 1955. Here's a story about Bing Crosby. So, uh, January 19th, uh, history's first test of its kind, two doctors in different cities concurred via color television today in diagnosing a breast cancer in a woman. Um, and so this was the contraption that they had uh, to move the image from uh, Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. So this was 1955, 50 years ago. And they also uncovered some of these schematics and designs about how the AFIP would have, uh, we never had an autopsy room when I was there, but apparently there was at one time, a TV microscope contraption, the auditorium, big master control, camera controls, and then Walter Reed, which is, uh, was across the street, had its own studio and control systems and whatnot to move these images rather than slides. Um, in any event, we got a couple of these things put into Iraq uh, during that conflict. Um, this guy is smiling here because he's got, a, he's got help in the field. He's got uh, instant access to AFIP uh, from one of the palaces uh, at the 31st Combat Support Hospital at the time. And apparently it's a scalable solution because we hired two more pathologists and uh, we also had a uh, 50 slide loader system installed 
as the volume increased, unfortunately. Um, and, and what happened would, uh, you would get same day results. So this is an actual case uh, with uh, identities protected. The case would come in at 9.30, be picked up by 10 o'clock. The branch reviewed it by 10.45, report out by 12, uh, and fax back to the contributor in those days, 12.45, and the case finalized. So if anybody has any experience sending cases to AFIP, sometimes it could take three weeks. Um, this took four hours. So part of the idea was that the consultants were on the hook in real time to look at these cases. All right. So that's the Army telepathology program. And I think it was and uh, unfortunately has not been sustained uh, terribly well because of the uh, base closures and the AFIP closing and whatnot. But I think it was the first real-time worldwide telepathology network. I quickly realized that um, not to undermine the technology and what goes into that and the effort and time that engineers put into this, the technology is kind of the easy part. Changing hearts and minds is the hard part. And I think that's kind of been a consistent theme here over the past day and a half. The other thing that was readily apparent to us at the time, although I was able to get $4 million of funding from generals in Congress, was that if I actually had to prove a business case, if I actually had to prove an ROI on the front end, it would have never been funded. It would have never been sustained. We certainly proved the ROI in terms of facilitating transfers, negating transfers by slide reviews. Uh, but if I actually had to put a business case together, I'm not sure I could have justified the $2 million with any return on investment initially. So it was myself and one project manager, and the thought was if it could be done in the U.S. Army, it could be done anywhere. If you build it, they will come. And I think that's a lesson learned from a lot of telepathology programs, digital pathology programs. If you're willing to take some risk, if you're willing to not accept a, a tangible ROI on the front end, if you build it, they will come. That's not a Yogi Berra quote. That's from Field of Dreams. Um, so the value propositions that I recognized early on were um, uh, when you're some distance from the slide, telepathology, teleconsult, call it what you want, um, and certainly image analysis. And I think the terms initially were being described about deep learning and AI, people using terms like content-based image retrieval, CBIR. There was mention of that earlier, I think, by Laurent, searching images with images. Um, so the value propositions over the past 20 years have not changed. I think they remain pretty consistent. The telepathology piece and the analytics piece. And I think as I'll come back to at the end, um, we are getting closer towards maybe not even using them for diagnosis, but using them, uh, them being whole slide images, as an adjunct to diagnosis. Um, so after about 13 years in the Army, um, they kicked me out, and I went into private practice and started to do remote consults. And this was about 2007, 2008. And there were commercial labs in the United States that would provide virtual immunosochemistry for their clients. So you would send them unstained slides or blocks. They would provide the stains, do the scanning, and send those images back to you. You, as the referring pathologist, got a huge menu of immunosochemical tests without the burden of implementing and validating all of that. And you were able to look at your slides the next day, much as you would your own laboratory. Um, so as, these, as this grew, as this consult practice grew, people would not only send in their immunosochemistry tests, but also their unknown cases, their difficult cases for consultation. And at the time, uh, in particular, Clarion did not have necessarily all the expertise and all the subspecialists, so they started to contract with other people as virtual consultants, and I'll show you a short list of that. But um, the lab would provide a service that wasn't available locally, and uh, get a second opinion very quickly, while the referring pathologist largely controlled that uh, paradigm. So if you were local to Southern California, theoretically you could get slides um, the next day and ha actually have an answer by the next afternoon. And in practice, if you could FedEx it overnight from anywhere in the country by Tuesday morning, chances are you could have got a consult by Tuesday afternoon, to be taking advantage of some uh, time zones. So at any given time, there were about eight or nine of us that were part of this virtual consult network. I called it a virtual pathology network because it was a VPN. It seemed to fit the uh, situation. Uh, but the, I think the actual commercial term was virtual consult network. Um, and the really neat thing was um, I, I had to do this. I had to do my Mayo work, and then I could do other work. Um, that was the deal. So uh, it would be after hours, central time in the States. But I could call on folks on the West Coast or on the East Coast that could also look at the same case at the same time and get help, whereas many of my colleagues may have been gone for the day um, at my institution. So you'd get a difficult case, complete unknown. You could go into their system, order the immunos, 
that were required result the case back to the, uh, the Clarion pathologist in that case. And of course, GE bought Clarion, and Clarion has since been resold to um, Neogenomics. But the lessons learned from that point were um, this idea of glassless consultation and having multiple folks uh, give their opinions um, at the same time using the same image. Okay. So where is this from? I think he's an Australian actor in the foreground. He's on Chicago Fire now, but he started out on this show. House. House MD. House. There you go. Okay. Uh, most popular, so this was the most popular show on television in 2008. In fact, I just looked this up on Wikipedia. Hugh Laurie was at one time one of the most watched men on television, apparently, in 2007, 2008. Um, but about this time, House was doing digital pathology, right? So uh, here's, who's this guy? James Wilson, right? He's the oncologist. So he's looking through the microscope and he's saying, definitely not cancer. And there's a screen, there's a picture on the screen. I have no idea how they got that picture on the screen because there's no camera here. Um, but, but, uh, but Hollywood, that's right. It's a Phillips image uh, that... <laughs> okay, that's cool. So that's how they got amyloid stains in like five minutes and stuff too, huh? They did, did all that. Cool. All right. So, uh, so Dr. Wilson, the oncologist, is looking at the digital image. He says, definitely not cancer. And he says, he checked the biopsy twice. It's not cancer. So you can feel better about that. And thanks to Olympus for providing the uh, image. All right. So... Um, image analysis. So the other, the other rally proposition, um, I think clearly was image analysis, um, recognizing that machines are not, uh, are good at counting, but not good at thinking, so better reproducibility. Um, and about this time, this came out of the papers um, after, I think, you know, honestly, probably um, um, collectively, uh, um, not the best experience with her too, and a lot of lessons learned from her too, that hopefully will take forward towards other personalized um, biomarkers, PD-1 and PDL l one um, as most recent ones. Um, but based on the ASCO CAP guidelines for HER2, uh, looking at the post-analytic factors in terms of interpretation, although debatable and a contentious issue uh, in the committees, image analysis would recognize as being an effective tool for achieving consistent interpretation. Um, and of course, the, the medical literature picked up on this, and of course, the popular press picked up on this in terms of HER2 reproducibility. And so we try to get together as a community and fix that and educate pathologists about interpretation and understand more about how the actual test, uh, what factors could affect the test and the results. So in our experience, uh, we used an Aperio system at the time to do HER2 on breast cancers. Uh, this is pretty standard in terms of the markups that are provided when you do an image analysis algorithm. And we also uh, started to uh, use co-registration uh, where you could have multiple images um, look at the same field or the same profiles roughly on four different stains at the same time, lock those in together. And I think start to, for the first time, really appreciate more cell biology rather than tumor biology, looking at a single slide at a time with different stains. And this was published um, showing that image analysis appeared more accurate uh, than manual analysis. Um, there were still some uh, cases that were underscored and overscored, but largely using FISH as the gold standard, which isn't 100% either, but using FISH as the gold standard, image analysis was more accurate than manual analysis. However, you know, took out some equipment, took some time, took some software. Um, I had a third year undergrad who became a pre-med student, uh, you know, help on the project. So it involved some, some people and some labor to do the, the work, and we weren't sure if the time would necessarily justify um, the result, unless you could really um, get away with not doing fish, because in those days you were actually paid for either the IHC or the fish, not both. So there was, there was some business cases to be made there. Um, this is an older slide. This is from a paper that uh, three of us wrote back in May of 2012, looking at the uh, 20 or so image analysis uh, applications that had 510K clearance from the FDA, looking at the specific reagent, the application, and largely breast markers, ERP or HER2, KS67. Um, there haven't been a whole, whole lot more actually developed, uh, either for the specific stains or for the specific scanners. Um, 
But it became clear to me that this was kind of, I think, where the future of digital pathology would be. Uh, maybe not CBIR, but definitely some form of image analytics, image analysis, I think what people are calling deep learning AI now, um, using hyperspectral light. Um, the sky was really the limit. The, 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 the image was the substrate for which we would do a whole heck of a lot more than simply looking at the case. So looking for the needle in the haystack rather than the haystack would be my analogy. So I really like this, uh, I really like that. Um, a lot of people went to his funeral, so he must have gone to a lot. Um, so the, um, the, last, the last half of this now is um, talking about pathology 2.0, um, which is a term I ended up trademarking about 2009. And it came out of a discussion uh, with the College of American Pathologists that would hold a, um, at the time they held a meeting called Futurescape of Pathology, and it was looking at the future of pathology. And so I was on the program committee, and you know, when you're on the program committee, you have to kind of throw out ideas and potential speakers to put together a program. So I said, well, somebody should talk on Pathology 2.0. And the president of the CAP Foundation said, you know, what the hell is Pathology 2.0? Only she didn't say hell. Um, but I'm not going to say that word. So, she's, so uh, I said, I don't know, but it sounds kind of cool. She said, okay, then you talk about it. So I had to come up with something. So the idea was how would, how would the new tools and technology, social media, be used in the practice of surgical pathology, if at all? And how might, that, how might our information be delivered as a source of information? So um, I just finished reading, or pretty close to finished reading, Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. If anybody's read that book, they know that one of the top 10 flatteners that he talks about is uploading as one of the most, disrupt, as one of the, as one of the most disruptive forces. Um, and it's this whole idea about social media where you allow content by users for users. The best content is immediately available and you can theoretically, this isn't always the case on Facebook and Instagram, harness collective intelligence. Um, and so I thought since we were an image rich specialty, um, digital pathology would be well suited. So in those days we were probably still kind of web 1.0, you know, you'd bookmark web pages that you liked and eventually we became web 2.0 which was read write web, um, more social media, content following you more rather than you following content. And we have actually moved into Web 3.0, the sort of portable personal web uh, based, on your, uh, based on your preferences, focused on the individual. Um, so now if you're going to travel to a city, you can kind of put that city in and applications may determine you know, where you like to stay, where you like to play golf, where you like to eat, et cetera. So it's, it's mining that content that it's developed over time. And of course, a lot of this coincides with mobile technologies. So, um, so I came up with this idea of pathology 2.0 that would be required for biomarkers, targeted therapies, and dedicated the, uh, chemotherapy, but recognizing, hopefully, that tissue would remain the issue um, and remain at the center of all of this. So um, using the images because they were consistent, efficient, and persistent rather than glass slides. So just to put this into perspective, in 2008, um, Facebook had 200 million unique visitors, um, or 200 million, it's probably actually maybe unique uh, users, uh, monthly users in 2008, July of 2008. Does anybody know what it is today? Not unusual for Facebook to have over a billion users a day. Not unusual. Um, that milestone was passed a while ago. Not unusual. MySpace didn't last. LinkedIn was at one time for professional use only, but that's kind of gone away. Uh, but in any event, um, social media was definitely on the rise, um, and the, the, the winners have succeeded. So I got this crazy idea, um, you know, getting on Twitter in those days. Um, Twitter was asking, what are you doing? And so the idea was Twitter would ask you that in 140 characters, you know, you'd say, having lunch with, with Jim or Joe or whatever, and that was the idea. It was, an, it was a messaging system initially in 140 characters or less, as we heard about yesterday. So I said, what about Twittering diagnoses? So theoretically, what if you could put in a whole slide image in Twitter? How cool would that be? You get millions of opinions. Now, some of them you wouldn't want. Um, there aren't millions of pathologists, so you would actually get millions of, um, of opinions. But you get a lot of opinions, potentially. So um, actually, this has taken off. So there are a number of folks now who post cases on Twitter and Facebook asking for an opinion between pathologists. And we heard uh, yesterday about some closed groups and things where people can collaborate on images. Um, folks that don't have sophisticated technology take pictures through their iPhones and post those pictures, etc. 
Some are a little bit more elaborate. Um, so people put together these very uh, nice case scenarios, clinical images, gross images, histological images, clinical vignettes. You can put in your comments, your diagnoses, and then eventually, some, sometimes they usually give you what the answer is. Um, and so this carried over to whole slide imaging as well. Um, so people would have this sort of shared community experience. We heard about groups of, uh, on Facebook and whatnot yesterday as well, and these have grown um, quite a bit as well. So again, the idea of, of sort of this shared experience community using whole slide images for um, collaboration. And then Twitter's kind of taken off. Um, if you've been to USCAP in the past few years, um, make sure to use the hashtag. Uh, but uh, we formed this group called Insight to Pathologists. Um, and I think in 2015, you know, we had a couple million tweets or impressions. Last year, I think we had 10 million tweets or impressions. And I think this year, we've had over 17 million um, impressions on Twitter. Um, and I don't think it's a substitute for going to the meeting, certainly. But I think it's cool when you're at the meeting, um, you can find out what's going on in other sessions and keep apprised about what's happening. Um, we'll see if microblogging lasts. I'm not sure. So people ask me, you know, why do I blog or, or why do physicians blog? Um, and I think largely um, a lot of physician blogs are, are kind of personal reflections or they try to expose fraudulent ideas or practices. Um, I did it because somebody dared me to and I got to liking it and I've been doing it for 10 years since and I yell at Bruce Friedman about once a month for talking me into it. Um, but I think what I try to do is academic blogging, a workspace, a workspace to explore and share new ideas, technologies, and practices. Disseminate new ideas for discussion, provide synergy between academia for collaboration. Um, so then this came full circle, so then we wrote a paper on uh, lessons that we learned as pathology bloggers. Um, and I guess, um, you know, people ask, what if I want to start a blog, you know, what's, what are the keys to it? And I would say, um, find your niche, um, take the time to do it, and you have to appreciate that for people to read what you write, um, you're asking them for their time as well, their greatest commodity. Um, and so you have to appreciate that you try to get in, make your point, um, and get out. Um, and it's competitive in the sense that there's a lot of uh, sources for information and news. So you might not be competing with other bloggers, but you're certainly competing with other news, in some cases peer-reviewed, vetted, et cetera. Why is all this important? Because um, uh, patients say that it is. 40% of consumers say that information found via social media affects the way they deal with their health. And 60% of social media users are more likely to trust social media posts and activities by doctors over any other group. So some of the, those are some of the things of um, what's worked. Um, and I'll kind of talk about what hasn't worked, largely. Um, and that is this whole idea of um, replacing the microscope. I don't know if anybody really believed 20 years ago, but it certainly hasn't happened. Um, you know, we can have shared expertise, coverage, collaboration, consultation, turnaround time, elimination of slide shipping and handling issues, et cetera, better connectivity. Um, but it isn't this panacea of pure digital um, all the time exclusively. So I have a different idea now. This is my, the new thing I'm working on. So Yogi said, the future ain't what it used to be. So I think the other part we've fallen short on, and I think we'll start to make some inroads into this now that we have FDA approval, is actually getting our, our images into the longitudinal health record. And I hadn't heard from anybody here in Australia that this was currently being done, but um, if it is, I apologize. But in my experience, um, our images are largely not part of the longitudinal electronic medical record or electronic health record. Um, at Mayo, we had a system to do that where you could put in clinical images, radiology images, histology images, and get that as part of the longitudinal um, healthcare record, which I thought was important. Um, but the pathologists hated this idea. Um, it took extra time. We didn't get extra money for it. And they didn't see the value in having snapshots of the patient's disease in time as part of the record. I think it's valuable, um, but not widely accepted. So of course, uh, I think with pride, we have historically been called the doctor's doctor, um, providing consultation to other physicians. Um, but that, I think, has been. Um, degraded uh, with the growth of commercial labs, subspecialty labs, and office labs, consolidate, consolidated healthcare systems. And I think certainly we've lost some status and stature, and I think others have talked about this over the past day and a half. So what I would propose is becoming the patient's doctor. Um, 
And instead of having this fragmented climate and IT issues, even within our own healthcare, quote unquote, integrated healthcare delivery systems, um, work to change that. So how do we do that? Um, reach out to the patient directly, actually. Become not only the doctor's doctor, but rest restore our relationship as the patient's doctor. So, um, and use technologies that facilitate that information transfer. So, I think digital pathology today is between laboratories and pathologists. That's how most of us have used it. Um, but I would propose actually making these images available to patients. So, you know, when I sound out a case now in my, in my hospitals, um, once the clinician actually checks a box that it's okay to view, the, the patients see their results directly. And I think that's becoming more and more commonplace. I think in Europe it's becoming more standard of care. Um, but they, the patients see their results right away now. We can't hide behind this paraffin curtain anymore, I think, where the reports, you know, had to be requested and somebody would sit down with them or whatever. So uh, make the images portable, make the slides available, make those reports available, which is already happening. Um, and be a patient advocate, be a true patient advocate. And I think, I think at least in the states, the digitization and democratization of medicine um, is going to drive this. So um, second to last slide here. I've shown this slide 100 times, probably borrowed it from Laurent 15 years ago. But he isn't here, so he doesn't have to know that. Um, but it's an old slide. And this was the value proposition you know, 15, 20 years ago. We're still talking about content-rich data sets, digital data set, whole slide images, do all these great things, virtual microscopy, telepathology, education, computer-assisted diagnosis before we knew what that was. But I would suggest actually putting the patient in the middle of that. So using the images, the information for online support groups, online tumor boards, portable images as they go from remote center to remote center or other consult centers, uh, more widely available second opinions as standard of care, um, web platforms, et cetera, um, and integrate some of these technologies. It's clear it's not going to be widely adopted by pathologists, um, but perhaps um, we can provide added value to ultimately to the customer, uh, the patient, um, using these technologies. So that's what we're going to work on for the next 10 years, and I'll be back in 10 years to let you know how that goes. Thank you.